Well, it is great to be with you uh, again this morning. Uh, Smed will be back uh, in the pulpit next week, but I get one more week with you to finish uh, this, this short study on uh, the book of Ephesians, just this prayer of Paul at the end of Ephesians chapter 1. So you can turn, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 1. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 23 this morning. And on a, a Sunday morning a couple months ago in September, there was a, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake in the eastern highlands of Papua New Guinea. That's a large earthquake, 7.6 magnitude. For context, uh, one of the most devastating earthquakes that we've had in, in North America in the last 30 years, the, the Northridge earthquake in, in Los Angeles in the 90s was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake. So on the Richter scale, 7.6, that's 10 times the magnitude. And that Los Angeles earthquake killed 60 people and caused billions in damages. And this, this Papua New Guinea earthquake would be something we would just watch on the news. We might see it uh, flip to the next headline, but for this church, it hit a little closer to home as we have friends, uh, a family, the cans that we sent to Papua New Guinea that live in the Eastern Highlands where this earthquake hit. So our friends, Zach and Cassidy Can, uh, baby Annie, Jude and Oliver stood in front of their house in Papua New Guinea on a mountainside and watch their house crumble, uh, watch the, the earth shake beneath their feet. And you can imagine the raw power on display, the earth shaking beneath your feet. The, the house that you've lived in for the last five years is in shambles in front of you. I'm sure many of you saw the, the images of Hurricane Ian uh, last month, uh, the hurricane in Florida. You saw the images of just whole beach cities wiped out by these winds. 150 mile per hour winds. And we watch these events, earthquakes, hurricanes, you see this raw power on display. So put yourself in the, in the shoes of Zach and Cassidy. Zach can with his two boys in tears as their house has fallen over. What do you do in that moment? What do you do to, to comfort your sons? Well, we're going to see in this passage this morning that the, the raw power of God, that power over all things, the power over earthquakes, over the wind, that power works on behalf of God's people. It works for their good. It is working for them and in them. So you can trust that God of power. Even when the earth shakes, you can trust that God. So I'm going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 23. We're going to see the, the power of God on display here. Ephesians 1, 19. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 18, Paul's prayer here. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. And last week we looked at, at this prayer, the start of this prayer that Paul prays for this church, praying for them to grow into maturity and praying that they would have deep-rooted convictions. We saw in verse 18 that they would have convictions. They would know the, the certainty of their salvation. They would have confidence in future salvation and what God would, would have for them in the future, their inheritance. And then in verse 19 Paul prays that they would have confidence in the power of God. The, the power of God, he says, that works toward us who believe for our good, on our behalf. So that's where we're going to spend our time this morning, looking at this power, God's immense power, the power over wind and waves, the power that can shake the earth. In verse 19, he describes this power. He says the the surpassing greatness of his power. This is an exceedingly great power. This speaks to the ability of God's power. God is able to do whatever he pleases. 
whatever he pleases. As opposed to us, to human weakness, we are unable. We can't keep ourselves alive. We can't keep ourselves healthy. We can't control our futures. We don't have power in ourselves. But God can do whatever he pleases. He is able. And he goes on further to describe this power. He's going to convince us of God's power. This is a working power. This is in accordance, he says, with the working of the strength of his might. He uses three more words here to describe God's power. It's a working power, it's a strong power, and it's a mighty power. God is working. It's active. God is not like a grandfather sitting back in a rocking chair. You could imagine a grandfather watching, watching two grandsons wrestle on the floor, saying, I'm just going to sit back and see how this plays out. I'm going to watch. I'm not going to intervene here. Well, God is not like that. He is not sitting back watching creation unfold. He is active. He is powerfully at work in creation. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power, actively upholding the universe, actively upholding the the sun and the moon and the stars, putting breath in your lungs. When you breathe, Your next breath, it's because God sustains you, because he is working. And it's a strong power. It's a working power, and it's a strong power, the strength of his might. This speaks to a visible power, a demonstrable power, like a bodybuilder. You can see the muscles. You know they're strong. God is demonstrably strong. And finally, he uses this word might. The word might here, this is the ability to overcome obstacles, It's an unstoppable power, you could say. There's nothing that can get in the way of this power. There's nothing out there that's stronger than this powerful God. In Christian, you can have a confidence because that power is working on your behalf. It is active. It is strong. It is mighty. It is unstoppable. Paul here is just stacking up God's power. Look how strong God is. He is unstoppable. He is demonstrably strong. He is working. And that power is at work in in you and for you, Christian. And Paul is going to do more than just tell us about this power. He's going to show us this power. He's going to demonstrate it for us. Last year, we had my wife and I had the opportunity to go to the the church uh, winter camp, our youth camp uh, with junior high and high schoolers. And I had heard about, it was the first time I'd heard about uh, students that could solve a Rubik's Cube in 30 seconds. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that existed until we were at the camp. And uh, it was one thing to hear about it. Okay, cool. That sounds cool. And then, and then you see it. And it's like this, this magic formula that they do to, to solve a Rubik's Cube. You, you, ha- you have to see it. I'm not just going to show you. I'm not just going to tell you, rather. I'm, I'm going to show you. And if you, if you run into a junior high boy after the service, you can ask him. I'm sure they'll have one. They can demonstrate it for you. Or it's like, like my son was in kindergarten last year. Uh, And if you remember kindergarten, you have show and tell. So Fridays was show and tell. And if you forgot to bring your show and tell item, you could still tell. You could tell them about your toy, but you couldn't show them. And that was such a bummer to to forget the toy. I I just have to tell my friends. I want to show them my toys. I want them to see it. Well, Paul here, he he didn't just tell us. I'm going to tell you about God's power. Now he's going to demonstrate it. I want you to see this power. I want you to see it at work. So now he's going to demonstrate the the power of God. So we're going to look at three fortifying demonstrations of God's power. These demonstrations of God's power to fortify us, to to grow our faith. Three fortifying demonstrations of God's power. So we would be convinced in our hearts, we'd be convinced of this power. So when the, the earthquake comes, when the trial comes, when temptation comes, in your own struggle against sin, against your flesh, that you would remember that this God has all power. So first, the first demonstration of this power of God is Jesus' defeat of sin and death. First demonstration, Jesus' defeat of sin and death. Look at verse 20. This power, which he, that is God the Father, brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God wielded this power, raising his son from the dead, raising Jesus from the dead. Christ, the the Messiah, the promised Savior. Back in Genesis 3, God promised that that a son would come, a son would be born to Eve that would crush the head of the snake. 
that would defeat sin and death. God promised to Abraham that a a seed would come, a son would come to bless all the nations of the earth. He promised to David in 2 Samuel 7 that a king would reign on the earth forever, that would rule over God's people. In Isaiah 53, God promises a, a suffering servant that would bear the guilt of God's people. This is the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, the one who was born as a baby, walked on this earth, and was murdered on a Roman cross, hung between heaven and earth, laid in a tomb, dead. And this death was a substitutionary death in the place of sinners, taking God's just punishment for sin. The other day I asked my kids, how do we know, how do we know that that Jesus' death was acceptable to his father? How do we know it was an acceptable sacrifice? And they said, well, because the Bible says so. I said, well, that's that's a safe answer. But what what in the Bible tells us, what is the proof that this sacrifice was acceptable? Because Jesus walked out of the tomb, because he didn't stay dead, because God raised him up, defeating death, defeating sin, an acceptable sacrifice. Romans 6, 23 The wages of sin is death. The the punishment we all deserve for our sin is death. All of us deserve that. And Jesus was raised from the dead, demonstrating his power over sin, his victory over sin and death. Death, it's called the great equalizer. Maybe you've heard that said before, the great equalizer. It comes for everyone, regardless of social class, rich, poor, regardless of your birthplace, regardless of your nationality, regardless of if you're a criminal or a king, death will come for you. And I think we can say that. We can all say, yeah, I understand I'm going to die. That's obvious. But, but we don't live that way. We don't actually think that very often. And this is the epitome of human weakness, death. Mankind that can do all of these great things, that can walk on the moon, all of these technological innovations, But mankind cannot defeat death. In death, the human weakness is so evident. We realize how helpful, how helpless we are. We imagine we have some level of control until death comes. In many of you here, death has come to your doorstop. It has come to you, toward your house, friends, family members, loved ones. You have experienced this tragedy You have seen this horrible reality, the devastating effects of sin, the the finality here of death, this bottomless pit of death. And here we see that Jesus conquered death. He conquered this great enemy, death, conquered sin. In verse 20, he goes on to say, "He, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So from the bottom, from the grave, all the way up to to the throne room of God, Jesus was raised up to the the right hand in the heavenly places. This is the the heavens where God dwells. And at his right hand, the right hand, this is a sign of power. The king would hold a scepter in his right hand. People would bow before the the scepter of the king. So to be at the the father's right hand is Jesus is in the, the place, the seat of authority. He is God. He is taking his seat as God, and he is seated. This means the victory is done. Jesus said, it is finished. He is seated in victory. He offered one sacrifice for sins for all time and sat down at the right hand of his father in victory. There's nothing left for us to achieve, nothing that we could earn, no no payment that we could give. Not something we could add on to. Jesus has already paid the price. We just believe that message. We trust him. He conquered sin and death. He sat down. The battle is won. Christian, for you, this means you are no longer a slave to sin. It does not have power over you. Jesus has has defeated sin. He has been raised up. He is seated in victory. And notice all of these are are past tense. These are things that have already happened. He has been raised. He has been seated. 
He'll go on to say, he has put, verse 22, all things in subjection under his feet. These are realities that we live in today, already accomplished. So we need to, to know this power, accomplished power, this victory, Jesus' defeat of sin and death. For you, Christian, you can have victory in this life, victory over sin, victory over temptation. That's where he's going to go in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 6, if you just flip ahead a page, it says, And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we have been raised up with Christ. We get to, to reign with Christ. We experience this victory with Christ. And back to in chapter one, he goes on in verse 21 to say, he is above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He subjected all things under his feet. So we find out here, there are, there are rival powers. There are other powers at play, other claims to authority and dominion. Jesus is over all of those. And that's going to bring us to, to our second point. First, that Jesus has defeated sin and death. That's the demonstration of his power. Secondly, second demonstration, Jesus' victory over his enemies. He is victorious, victorious over enemies. He says in verse 21, he is above all rule and authority. Authorities, these are structures in our life that, that tell us what to do. The government is an authority. Sometimes my, one of my children will say, I, I don't love the, the food that we're eating tonight. Can we have something else? They'll say, you know, when you are on your own and you, and you pay for the bills and you buy the groceries, you get to pick the food. But when you're, when you're here, we decide and you just get to say thank you because you, you have to live under authority. You are in our home still under authority. We have these authority structures. Parents have authority over children. And Christ is over all of these authorities. This is what we tell our kids. You need to, to listen to mom and dad, not because we have some inherent authority, not because we are so special, but you need to listen to your parents because Jesus has actually placed you in this home. So when you submit to your parents, that's what Ephesians 6 says, children obey your parents in the Lord, you're obeying your parents because you're submitting to Christ. You're submitting to his authority. And we submit to the government because we're submitting to the lordship of Christ who has sovereignly placed the government over us. Jesus is, is the authority over all authorities. No one tells him what to do. He does whatever he pleases. All authority has been given to him. And obviously here in verse 21, you could say Jesus is above all worldly powers, all kings of the earth. Uh, that's, that's obvious. Nations are going to rise and fall. He's above the king above all kings. But here in this verse, uh, these descriptions, all of these words in verse 21 are, are I believe, references to, to demonic powers, to the, the realm of Satan. When he says he is above all rule, authority, power, dominion, the, the idea behind these words is actually a demonic influence, the, the, the satanic realm. It, it turned forward to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Look at verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10, he says, Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and put on the strength of his might. You have the same idea here. God's strength for this battle. What's the battle? Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but is against the rulers, that's the same word, against the powers, same word as in chapter one, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you go back to, to chapter one, he, he's talking about this, this battle. There is a, a spiritual battle here. There are satan satanic demonic powers at work that you are battling in Ephesians 1, he, he wants to fortify us for this battle. Encourage us that, that Jesus is, is ruler over all of these rulers, all of these authorities. 
in this spiritual battle, when we think about satanic activity, you know, sometimes you might hear like something physically happened. Oh, the light went out at church. Satan must be behind that. Well, Satan's not behind light, lights going out. Satan is behind ideas. He is behind thoughts. He is behind false ideologies. It is a battle over the mind. 1 Timothy 4.1 says that false teachers teach doctrines of demons. False teachers that come into the church teach truth that is contrary to the scripture. And Paul says those are doctrines of demons. Those are demonic doctrines. That's what Satan does in this world. It's a battle for truth, a battle for the mind, a battle for what you believe. Just think about back in the garden, Genesis chapter 3. The temptation of Adam and Eve. What does Satan do? He questions God's word. Did God really say? That's where he engages this warfare. At the level of truth in the mind. Did God really say? He's casting doubt on God's word. Then he says, God did not say, you will surely die. He calls God a liar. He's saying, this is what you believe about God. I'm going to tell you something else about God. That's a battle for the mind. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. A similar idea here. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is the, the spiritual warfare, this battle for, for thoughts, for ideas, battle for the right knowledge of God. So this battle is raging, and Jesus is seated in victory, victory over enemies, over every power and dominion, every false ideology. He has power over, this thing, over these things. And this should fortify us in a world full of, of godless thinking, uh, of falsehood, of lies that, that come at you. Everywhere you look, social media, news, in, in the world, there are so many things competing for truth. And here, Jesus has victory. So, so put it together now for the Christian, the one who is victorious, who has power that's working for the Christian. You have that power working on your behalf. As you walk in a world that, that rails against the truth, you must entrust yourself to the power of God. You have every resource in Christ, every resource in Christ for this battle. Whatever deception, whatever worldly influence, whatever lie comes at you, you need this divine power. Jesus, who is seated in victory, who works this power. And Paul goes on to say, he is above, verse 21, he is above every name that is named. Every name that is named. The city of Ephesus was a, a pagan city. A city full of witchcraft, full of sorcery, full of idolatry. The magicians, you remember in Acts 19 when the, Paul comes to the city of Ephesus. The, the demonstration of their repentance, when they came to faith in Christ, many of these people, they burned their books of magic. They're practicing all this witchcraft, sorcery, calling on all these demonic names, looking for power in all these places. And Paul here says that Jesus is the name above every name. All these false gods, all these pagan deities. Jesus is above all of these. Jesus is supreme. I want you to turn back to, to Acts 19. Keep your hand in Ephesians, but turn back to Acts 19. I just want you to see this when Paul was, was in Ephesus. So Paul writes this letter uh, six or seven years after he's left Ephesus. And what led him to leave Ephesus is in Acts 19, starting in verse, uh, starting in verse 23. Acts 19, 23. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, that is, the Christians, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. And these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that 
gods made with hands are no gods at all. So, so you see what's happening here is this silversmith is saying, we're, we're going out of business. These people are following Christ. They're not worshiping pagan deities anymore. No one wants to buy the, the shrines that we're building for Artemis. So now we're not going to have jobs. We're going to be destitute because of this guy, Paul, and his message of Christ. So he stirs up a, a mob. Look what he says in verse 27. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificent magnificence. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage and they began crying out saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They cry out to the name of this pagan deity, this idol, as if she has power. Great is Artemis. And the whole city is in an uproar. uproar. Verse 34. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This whole city chanting the name of this, this false goddess, this pagan deity. You can go back to, to Ephesians 1. So now when, when Paul is saying Jesus is above every name that is named for this city that, that kicked him out of town. He was driven out of town after this. His last memory in Ephesus is, is a pagan city crying out to, to Artemis. He is saying Jesus is the name above every name. Just think about how encouraging this would be for the, the believers in this city. They're being perhaps persecuted. A city is against them because of Christ. He's saying he is above Artemis. He is above these pagan deities. He is in victory. You, you can find your strength and your hope in him. Despite what's going on in the world around you, despite what other people claim to have power, Jesus has all power. The only name by which men can be saved. He is supreme. So on display here in these verses is an exalted Christ, victorious Christ, one who is worthy of all praise, one who deserves all praise. All honor and glory is his alone. He is owed those things. So it's a good time to ask ourselves, to ask this question. Does your life reflect those truths? Do you live as if Jesus is king of kings? Do you live as if he is the name above all names? Does your life reflect the truth that he is Lord of heaven? Do you go to work on Monday? Is it obvious? I serve the Lord of heaven. He's transformed my life. Is that true of you? He goes on in verse 22 to talk about this victory of Christ. Verse 22, he says, he put all things in subjection under his feet. Again, victory in view here. All things being subjected to Christ under his feet. In the Old Testament, kings would show their dominance in war. After they, after they defeated an enemy, they would put their boot on the neck of the enemy to, to show that they had conquered. So when Jesus is, all things are under his foot. That is a picture for, for dominance, for victory. This is the, the ultimate sign of disrespect, you could say, for an enemy. To have them, their face in the mud as you step on their head to, to show that you have won. This reminds me of the, the, the football team, not as extreme, but the football team that, you know, wins the, the away game and, and dances on the home team's logo, you know, at center field. To, to show our, our dominance, to show that we have, we have defeated you. We want to prove to you. So the rival kings here are bowed to the ground. Jesus, his foot on their head. This is triumph. He has defeated sin and death. He has defeated all his enemies. And you see this picture throughout the Old Testament. I was, I was reminded of, of Daniel's vision, Smed. Smed preached through Daniel recently, Daniel chapter seven, this vision of the son of man, the, the king who would come, a, a man who is, who is also God, who rules in heaven. I want you to listen to Daniel seven, verses 13 and 14. Daniel has this vision. He said, behold, the clouds with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and he was presented before him. 
And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Jesus, the son of man here, the rightful king of earth. That's what's going on here. Jesus is taking his place as king. This is exactly what Psalm 110 verse 1 says. David prophesies. David prophesies and he says that, that Yahweh God would say to this coming king, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's exactly what's going on here. Jesus is taking his rightful place as king, as judge, the, the son of man, the heir to the throne, all of his enemies subject, subjected to him. And this one, this Jesus who has all power, who has defeated all enemies, works on behalf of those who believe. Remember what it said in verse 19, this power, this God of power works toward us who believe. That is those who have faith in Christ, those who have submitted. Jesus is, is king in their life. They have trusted in him for, for salvation of their soul. So if that is you, if you have trusted in Christ, Jesus is your king. You have this power, access to this power. And there is another audience in this room. There's another audience in this room, perhaps one who, who is here that does not know Jesus as king, that does not have faith, that is not united to him in faith. If Christ is not the Lord of your life, if he is not your highest good, if his glory is of no concern to you, you must know that this great power of Christ it does not work for you. You cannot and you should not take comfort in this passage. You should not take comfort in the power of Christ. He has all authority and dominion and he will judge. And all of us will stand before this exalted Christ. And if you don't know Christ, then, then you will, will stand before him, not bowing to him as king, but, but under his foot being judged by this exalted king. And he will exercise that unstoppable power against you in your destruction. And, and today, there is hope for you. There is still hope. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you can be reconciled to Christ. There is hope in the gospel. There is hope in Jesus, a free offer of salvation. This resurrected Savior, he, he died in the place of sinners. He is a kind Savior, a gracious King. You must humble yourself in faith before this King. I want you to go back to, to verse 21 here. I skipped a, I skipped a phrase. He said that Jesus has all rule, authority, power, dominion. At the end of verse 21, not only in this age but also in the one to come. This age and the one to come, you have these, these two different ages, these two different periods of time. This current age, you could say the church age, where we sit today, between the comings of Christ. And there's a, a future age, a coming age, when Jesus returns and, and sets up his kingdom. Jesus reigns in this age, in the age to come, in the future, will continue to reign. This is an eternal reign. It will not stop. It will not end. In heaven, Jesus will reign. He is reigning today. If we closed our Bibles here and we walked out the door and, and you look around at this world, and you read the news and you interact with people, you might be tempted to ask the question, is Jesus really reigning today? Is this true? Is he really on his throne reigning? It doesn't seem like it sometimes. Violence in the world, immorality, just conflict among people, unrest, is he really on his throne? Well, it's going to bring us to, to the third point here. The, the focus here of Jesus' reign today in this age. Third demonstration of God's power. First was his defeat of sin and death. His resurrection and ascension. His victory over enemies. And now lastly, God's power demonstrated in Jesus' reign over the church. Jesus reigns over the church. 
So we stand before the, between the, the comings of Christ. He came once, he'll come again. We wait for him to return. And, and Jesus exercises this reign, this authority in his reign over the church. This is what God is doing in the world. He is doing through the church, through his people in the world. So you could ask, why hasn't Jesus returned? What is he waiting for? What is he doing today? Well, he is still calling sons and daughters into his kingdom. He is still calling rebels to be part of his family. That great power of God, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is focused on his people. The, the preaching of his word, sinners being made, made alive through, through God's spirit working in their hearts. In the church, the church, which is the, the pillar and support of the truth, upholding God's truth in the world, proclaiming a, a message of hope. People who demonstrate this powerful work of God through transformed lives. So Jesus is not passively sitting on his throne. He is not silent today. He is not inactive. He is not indifferent. He is actively working through and among his church. That's what God is doing in the world. Verse 22, it says, after he, he subjected all things under his feet, and he gave him, that is the father gave the son as head over all things, to the church. So he gave him, Jesus, the one who is head over all things, the one who has authority over all things. That one was given to the church. And you could, you could infer that as their head, he's the head over all things, and now he's the, the head of the church, the, the ruler of the church, the, the life giver of the church. To be the head is to have authority and rule. The head directs the body. Think about our physical bodies. The head tells us what to do. It directs us. Jesus is the, the ruler of the church. The, the church, this is the called out people of God. People who have been called out of this world, who have embraced the gospel message. They are now part, part of God's family. The, the church is the people of God in this age. God's people are the, the church, not a building, a people. Those who are united to Christ in faith, that is the church. People who have saving faith in Christ. And you know this, many people can show up in a building on a Sunday. Many people would claim, yeah, I'm part of a church. And Jesus would say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus says there are many who are going to claim his name who are not actually his. So the church here, this is what theologians would call the invisible church those who have actually been redeemed by Christ, who have been bought by his blood. And he says in verse 23, which is his body. The church is his body. So, so Jesus, the one who rules over all things, was given to the church a, a gift to be its head, to be its leader, its protector. I found a helpful definition of one theologian about just this metaphor of, of the body of Christ, the church being Christ's body. He writes, under this figure, the church is represented as an organism, as having a vital connection with Christ, as under the superintendence of Christ, as being a unit, although made up of Jews and Gentiles, as having a diversity of gifts among the members, and as ideally cooperating in performance of one common task. Not, not an organization, an organism, a living organism made up of people united in Christ. And the idea here is a single body, collectively. Obviously, we meet in, in local assemblies. You have these local assemblies of churches with, with God-ordained structures in churches. But this is the idea of a collective, all of those who have been united to Christ in faith, that are united to the head who is Christ. And that's where the, the power comes from, our union with Christ, being attached to him. In this image of a body throughout the New Testament, it speaks to our, our connectedness to each other, to us building each other up, exercising giftedness, encouraging one another, but all under the lordship of Christ, going together after the same mission. And that gives us the foundation for unity in the church. Being united to Christ makes us united to each other. 
We, we don't represent ourselves. It's a body. And we represent Christ. Together, we represent Christ in this world. He, he is the head. He is the source of strength. He is the, the ruler. He gives direction. And look at how Paul ends this section. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a difficult statement here. What does it mean that him, the fullness of him who fills all in all? We'll just start with the him. The him is Jesus. Back to Jesus. Jesus is the one who fills all in all, the one who fills up all things. All in all would be a, all things entirely, completely. All things find their completion in Christ, you could say. You could say what this passage has been saying, that he is Lord over all things. All things derive their, their sustenance in him. He fills all things. So Jesus, the one who fills all things, who brings all things to their final conclusion, he exercises that power. He fills up the church. The church is being filled up by Christ, the one who fills all things. The church is life comes from Christ, the one who gives life to all things, you could say. The one who reigns over all things reigns over the church. So, so Christian, what this is saying is you have every resource in Christ. He is a resource to the church. He empowers the church. He gives life to his people. This is such a helpful truth for us in your battle this week, in your battle against sin, in your battle against temptation. You have every resource in Christ. And there are times when we might, we might feel defeated. I just can't have victory in this area. It's so hard, so discouraged. In those moments, if you feel defeated, it might be because you are trying to find strength in yourself. Christ is the source of strength. He is the one who, who gives us the resources for, for obedience. We didn't begin our spiritual lives. We, we don't have the power to complete them. But Christ works for you and in you. He gives you everything you need, circumstances, or struggles, sin, temptation, whatever comes your way, whatever influences, worldly influences come at you, you have every resource you need in Christ. That's what this passage is saying. Another implication here for us, just consider if you want to experience this power, you want to experience the, the power of God, give yourself to, to the life of the church, to God's people, to what God is doing in the world calling out sinners from death to life. If you've ever seen someone uh, parasail before, they position the, the parasail with the wind. They let it go and then they just fly. They take off. So, so position yourself in line with this power, what God is doing in the world through his word proclaimed in the local church with God's people. God is saving sinners, putting his grace on display through, through his people. I want to take you back to, just imagine, go, go back to that, that mountain range in Papua New Guinea. And put yourself in the, in the canned shoes, you know, in this earthquake, watching your house crumble, seeing this raw power. As I was thinking about that this week, it just reminded that that, that is not the only demonstration of power on that mountain range. You can say that's not even the greatest demonstration of power on that mountain range. Zach can in November 2020, after, after 10 years of, of training here, 10 years of prayer and training and study, being a churchman, he's sent out with a team. After five years of, of language acquisition, learning a language, learning a culture, starting to, to translate scripture, in November 2020, Zach began to, to preach the gospel. He began to preach God's word. He preached a message of a, of a creator and a judge, one who made all things. And he preached a message of, of that, that creator who sent his son to, to die for sinners. He preached that message on that same mountain range. You know Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That is God's power on display. 
when sinners are brought from death to life. That is God's power. And Christian, you have experienced that power. You have been brought from death to life. You know that power. It works in you. It works for you. You have access to that power. It conforms you to the likeness of Christ. And you have power this week over temptation, over sin, whatever struggle comes your way. The power of God is working for you. And then that same power will keep you. It will bring you safely home. Would you pray with me as we close? God, we uh, are in awe of your, your power, of your power that is demonstrated in the, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you are our king. You have all authority. You have all power. You have all dominion. I pray that our lives would reflect these truths this week, that we would live in such a way to, to demonstrate your power, to be, to be lives that, that model a transformed life, your power at work in a heart, your power that, that gives us the, the ability now, divine ability to, to say no to sin, to fight the flesh, and your power that, that keeps us safely. Lord, we trust you. We love you. Jesus, pray that all, all glory would be given to you, even today. Amen.